uh, uh, summary session where our task is, or we were tasked at the beginning to all of us to report on three sessions each. Um, I think for the sake of simplicity, we won't follow uh, the sessions in chronological order, <coughs> but each one of us will but talk about... So Do you have a presentation? Yeah, but that can stay at the end. Yeah, it's okay. Does it? Yeah, yeah okay. Fine. All right, so we each will talk about the three sessions that we are reporting on, rather than jumping back and forth. I think that's a bit difficult. And um, you all know, if you were speakers, how difficult it is to present your work in 10 minutes. <laughs> It's even more difficult to do it in two minutes or in one, one minute for a panel or how much time have we actually, we have um, one, hour. one hour, okay. And there's it's much better. Right. So 10 minutes, 10 minutes each and yeah, okay. All right, then I will make a start. Uh, the first uh, panel I'm reporting on is um, 1.2, educating culturally different, environmentally responsible, and globally aware citizens. That was a title. And uh, uh, I was the moderator of that panel, and I kicked off the discussion by proposing a, um, the idea of geocentric education, and uh, identified a number of uh, principles that need to be observed such as custodianship for, for the earth, a sort of a perspective that's uh, holistic, that is a different identity to what we are used to, so an, an identification with the living whole that is the earth. So um, there are certain consequences that, that follow from, from that position. Um, it's about... Um, in order to, uh, to uh, fulfill our, our um, human uh, purpose of being custodians of, of the earth, uh, we, we have to have a certain humility, we have to have uh, uh, respect for all life, we have to see ourselves as totally a, a part of that, whereby as individuals, as a species, we are just an intersection. We are not, there's no boundary around us. Uh, everything, every cell, every atom in our body comes from somewhere else and it goes somewhere else, even as we are living. Um, and therefore, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different kind of, uh, sen a different sense of self that, that should be instilled in, in young people. And I think, uh, there are a whole lot of things that, are, that, are ha that have happened uh, to make that actually possible because people today are exposed to so many different cultural frames through migration, through travel, uh, through media, that they, it's perhaps a little easier to dissenter and to question <coughs> the assumptions of our worldviews. And being an anthropologist, I sort of see this as an anthropological moment in, in human history where we kind of step out of our cultural frames and at the same time also respect that diversity of cultures. Okay. Saulo was talk, Saulo uh, Casali Bahia from Federal University of Bahia in Brazil. He was uh, talking about multiculturalism in his country based on the experience in his country and he he was talking about the need to, for multiculturalism to be under, underpinned by shared values. Um, we had a sif similar argument being made in one of the plenary sessions too. So there's a sort of like a federalism, you know, they had a, common, a common identity and the sense of shared fate, uh, fate or, or, or destiny that needs to be cultivated. Uh, so a kind of a unity in diversity and from that that has to provide um, certain shared understandings also of uh, fundamental needs, fundamental human rights, uh, fundamental necessities such as ensuring a healthy <coughs> environment. Uh, Liliana Markovic 
uh, a philologist here from Belgrade spoke about uh, how students should be at the center of, of education, of learning, um, and that how we need to build on the individual's personality in the sort of so Socratic tradition. And uh, being an Asianist, she pointed out that those traditions are also very strong in Asia. And in a way, we've kind of lost our way a little. Uh, there's, there's no way of going back to the past, but we can learn from it. Uh, Marco Vigiello spoke about soft skills, about um, a, uh, cultivating a, a kind of a, a process of, of self-realization, of genuine self-actualization through education, and a real freedom based on cooperation, not on you know, an individu individualistic, isolationist perspective, but a freedom through cooperation, a uh, freedom that's embedded. And Vesna Vucinik here from Belgrade University spoke about uh, a, a case study about integrating anthropology as a bridging science into secondary education. It's very interesting just to see when you look at case studies about change, how difficult it is and how much resistance there is when you're trying to realize what is ostensibly a very good idea, it's very difficult to actually uh, make it happen. And it's a lot of work. So really change in education, uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of people have to work on this and, and tirelessly and it takes a lot of commitment. Okay, but that kind of knowledge, she argued, is, is very vital uh, in today's world. All right, I'm going to stop. Then panel 4.2, um, uh, it was about um, uh, closing the skill gap uh, through education. Uh, we had uh, Vladika uh, Zvetkovic, um, uh, he talked about the prerequisites uh, for educational reform and uh, the two aspects that he highlighted is the who and the where. Who, meaning who are the, you have to have the right people to bring about change, and where is you have to consider the environment, the context. You can't, uh, uh, it's difficult to universally, uh, universalize, have a one, one a size fits all. And it's, he pointed out the difficulty of having the right people, and what do you do if you have an education system full of people who, uh, who were hired on the wrong criteria, perhaps, uh, who, uh, who haven't got the right training, and what do you, how do you retrofit you know, new, new educational uh, strategies onto a, a, a faculty that, that, that is not really, wasn't really prepared for that? Dora Melnik from um, Moscow um, uh, was works on educational development, um, uh, she uh, pointed out that each university should uh, 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 place themselves. They should look at what is their relationship with industry, with the state, and it's always unique. And um, we should uh, ask ourselves, are we strategic partners? Are we driving educations? Are we at the receiving end? And uh, just, just sort of understand the forces that act upon us and our, our, our sort of scope uh, for shaping things. Uh, uh, Jasna Atanasi Jirit, I hope I, J <laughs> I'm sorry, I hope I didn't get that right, I'm sure, uh, spoke about um, uh, skill gap, uh, gaps in relation to um, uh, technological uh, uh, change and made a distinction between <coughs> hard skills and soft skills, though in the discussion I think we came to the conclusion that, uh, that it, it, we have to understand that hard skills are actually uh, weak and that soft skills are actually strong in the sort of sense of Taoist philosophy because soft, soft skills are adaptable. So we have to really uh, 
develop a new understanding of those soft skills, not just an, as an adjunct, but as central and, and strong. Okay. And uh, she, um, she gave some examples uh, from uh, the Serbian context. Uh, then there was Surendran Shantakumari Srijit, uh, who had an interesting case study from South India where their university got really negative feedback from, entrepreneur, uh, from, from employers saying, oh, we don't want your graduates anymore. They, we, they're disappointed, they're not prepared. The teachers were reporting that students had poor morale, didn't really work uh, very well. And they in initiated a number of reforms which didn't require huge investment, but really a change of attitude and really transformed uh, their university, much more student-centered learning, cooperative learning, co-design, involving the students in shaping the educational process, and it had really amazing results. That was a great, great case study from GIIMS, it's called the Institute uh, for Integral Management Studies in Cochin. Okay. Um, I now go to panel 5.3 on value-based uh, value education. Uh, Milena uh, Tajicevic-Sesic, uh, who has a UNESCO Chair in Cultural Management here at the University of Belgrade, uh, uh, spoke about the problem of the sort of competitive spur that we have in education, the whole quantitative uh, metrics-based assessment of university performance and how um, um, how that uh, constrains the university and, and, and really, I mean, we have to acknowledge that it's very well to talk about change, but there's such uh, restrictions placed on universities today, uh, and that's that those are two of the uh, aspects of it. Um, she gave the example of art universities. Uh, that she works with. Um, so in these art universities, they, they seek to train students uh, in so on, you know, on socio-political and cultural issues, on contemporary issues, making them uh, 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 question things like established identities, uh, est established ideas of history, established assumptions about the nature of contemporary challenges. Um, but as I said, she stressed that, you know, the reality is we have these uh, neoliberal uh, corporate universities now, um, and we have a remnant of a uh, traditional academic ethos, and neither of them really is quite uh, on target, and we have to find uh, new, new ways. Um, then, um, Felicia uh, uh, spoke about the Finnish model, which is also very interesting. As you probably know, uh, Finland um, on the PISA ratings always does uh, very well, often first ranked. And um, uh, even the World Economic Forum has very strongly commended the Finnish model, and she, she spoke about the 10 principles in that model. Um, no standardized testing, that sounds strange. Uh, compared to the American system, for example, which very much uh, relies on standard testing. Um, there's no uh, teacher accountability. It sounds shocking at first, but teachers are actually given autonomy and empowered. Stu school starts uh, quite late, um, at age seven, and also late in the day, so children aren't forced to get up really early when their, their, their brains aren't ready. There's a sort of an attitude of going back to basics and also paying attention to uh, externalities, you know, ex external factors such as providing children with three, uh, free meals at school, free health care, uh, free counseling if, if they're required, um, and opportunities for practical learning. Um, they also, uh, uh, in their system, the children develop a, a close relationship to their teacher because the teachers accompany them through, uh, over, over many years, through their uh, 
uh, journey through school. There's less homework, um, and also teachers are highly regarded in the society, and they strongly identify with the success uh, of their students. They take pride in their work, and they're respected in the community. Okay, I think that <coughs> covers it. Uh, then we had Charles uh, Zaltes from Cyprus, uh, who's a psychologist and educationist, uh, who provided a fantastic uh, uh, case study on Cyprus, a divided island, as you know, between the Greek and the Turkish ethnic, uh, ethnic communities there, and there's conflict, we all may, will, will have heard of that. But uh, they uh, developed a really interesting uh, 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 project across the two communities on history, how to um, teach history in a unified way. So they, they set up a committee to uh, develop a shared understanding of history, of their common history on Cyprus. And I think it's, it's, it's a fantastic way to overcome conflict. And, uh, you know, as other, others have said, you know, uh, history can be weaponized. It can be used as a tool for, you know, uh, reactionary nationalist agendas, but you can also uh, use history to, to or a, a shared understanding of history to, to create new futures. That's a very interesting experiment. Okay, and then we had um, uh, Oksana uh, Sliusarenko from the Ukraine National Academy of Science, who uh, spoke uh, to us about the many global changes uh, in, in, in education, uh, things such as sort of the expansion of preschool ex education, um, the fact that we live in an information society where uh, knowledge in that sense is, is, is overabundant and we, we have to help uh, develop in students uh, strong deductive skills, in other words, the ability to summarize that that uh, information and, and uh, understand what's important, what is not, and to be adaptable also to the ever growing uh, new knowledge. She, meant, uh, she pointed out the course of distance education. What does that mean for localized education on a campus? What, what, what uh, will be the outcome of that? The fact that uh, the web uh, the internet undermines the, uh, uh, the uh, knowledge monopoly of acad the ab academic world, of the knowledge sector per se. Um, the marketization of education, uh, the increased mobility, uh, so it's a global market now for education. That means what does how does education then respond to that as well as a national agenda? Uh, okay. Okay, and uh, Mila Popovic uh, advocated for a long-term transformative strategy for exponential change and um, argued that we need a higher perspective and that such a perspective needs to be based on higher principle, principles in order to be successful. I'll close there because I'm out of time. And I'll hand off. Would you like to? The session 1.3 was about getting out of the box in education by fostering creative thinking and innovation. The changing role of social science and humanities was discussed. <coughs> social science maneuvers human <coughs> development. By analyzing the past, we can predict and prevent the problems of future. It is important to identify and address issues in rapid speed, not only to survive, but also to thrive. Results of research in humanities are not tangible and are not easily measured. We need to grow spiritually and not to be mercantile by focusing on quick profits by the social sciences. Then we also talk about the changing meta message of educational experience. 
Educational content must be taught with context and logical environment. Students should be taught to perceive complexity and how to respond to it. When taught well, ecology shows that forest is the relationship with the trees, animals, and land. We understand the whole and not just the parts. Students learn interdependency when taught in a nourishing classroom environment. Complexity and unpredictability are the nature of life. More knowledge brings more complexity. Living and learning systems are continuous feedback loops. In schools, we ignore the nature of life and we teach certainty. We ask students to conform to the teacher's knowledge. Partial educational reforms worsen the efficiency. Policy makers do not understand the mental process of creativity, but they create the guidelines. Teachers simply implement the guidelines without focus on content or process. This leads to poor quality of educational system. We also heard on game-based learning strategies in this session. This fulfills the needs of Gen Z, the younger generation born in the digital era. Playing as a method, technique, and mindset. Immersive social stimulation games teach complex systems in a better way. Gaming satisfies the psychological needs for competency, interaction, and risk taking. We need to balance fun and purpose to build core skills. These are the main points discussed on that session. The next session is 4.1, one, interdisciplinarity in digital scholarship. Efforts taken in informal education and their interdisciplinary approach were highlighted here. The Ethnographic Museum taught the Serbian history and traditional artifacts in its educational programs for several years. Since 2003, they offer interdisciplinary workshop for children. Theater play involving children and actors are enacted during Christmas. Customs related to bread making and the chemistry of bread are taught. Similarly, um, the history of painting on eggshells and also the chemistry of egg and its contents are taught. Such immersive projects coupled with technology make learning fun and effective. They are also building a digital museum by presenting the content in a visual interface. In this session, we heard about the strategies and impact of Austria's digital platform. They focus on interdisciplinarity and have built a technology as an aid to learning process. This digital platform enabled them to bring in change in the curriculum, provide individualization, and major competencies. The online portal for students and teachers tests their skill sets and then offers educational programs and courses for self-reflection and self-directed learning. Self -directed learning. Students are taught to use technology positively we also heard about educational challenges related to data science across disciplines. People, business, and devices are data factories pumping out incremental data, amount of data. 90% of internet data are created since 2016, and the speed is only rapidly growing. As we build more internet of things, very soon everyday household objects will generate and consume data with little human interaction. Data science is the study of this unstructured data that are to be prepared for machine learning. Data science is successfully used now in medical field and also in automated self-driving cars. When this field of study is used in industries, it will form the basis for the fourth industrial revolution. We are asked by the panelists to prepare the educational system to be flexible to adapt to these changes brought by sci data science. Methods to build interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity in human humanities and social science were presented. In terms of knowledge capacity, students are not taught to use digital tools in a methodical way. They learn it in an informal structure by themselves and their peers. Social science scholars are not rewarded for creating digital content that can be reused by others. They are rewarded only for publishing papers. A digital platform has become a safe place for scholars to learn, explore, and collaborate. It is not merely a technical tool. It changed the way scholars research, think, and also their perspective and knowledge has changed. 
The next panel is 5.1 on the topic shift from subject centered education to student centered education. <coughs> Open educational resources termed as OER allow personalization, adaptation and creates a shift in teaching practice. The content is affordable and reusable. Teachers make use of great curricula that is already available. OER ensures equitable access, collaborative opportunities, and scaling systems. It supports, supports self-directed learning, flexibility, and increases interest in the learner. Half of the countries in a survey of 105 countries said that they see increasing support for OER. Conditions required for student-centered approach were explained by the next panelist. He said students must take responsibility for learning and at the same time, Teachers must take responsibility for facilitating. Leonardo went to school that also created four other great scientist artists. This implies the capacity of the school and the master who kindled the genius. Instead of hammering information into the child, we need to show how the information is relevant to the society and his life. Teachers should not ask questions that have no <coughs> simplistic answers. Instead, teachers must ask open-ended questions and explore along with the students. To bring fundamental changes in learning, teachers must accept new models and must not stick only to their discipline. Younger generation born in the digital world have distinctive characteristics. They see themselves as global citizens, are mobile, and they want to contribute to society. Blended learning is the best suited method for them. This method encourages flexible formats of content and pedagogy. The major challenges for education were um, listed as the impact of brain and machine interface and the next challenge was the changing role of teachers and their resistance to it. Networking is cited as one of the solution for developing countries to build a better educational system. Education must develop the person, his capacities, character, and personality. We need to shift from transfer of information to nurture thinking, a shift from one-size-fits-all model to personalized, customized model, a shift from respect for authority to respect for the individual. That's the summary. Thank you. esteemed colleagues, let me give uh, you a short review of a number of sessions. I'm going to talk about panel discussions 2.2, 3.3. Is it okay? Okay. Okay. And 4.3. Let me start with uh, session 2.2. Uh, the title uh, of the session is uh, Hybrid and Flipped Educational Models Combining Physical and Virtual Technologies. The session uh, is, was uh, entirely devoted to high-tech education, high-tech uh, uh, methods, high-tech uh, facilities in uh, modern education. And the session started with the concepts of innovation and disruption, the role of innovation and disruption in modern times and in modern economy. Uh, particularly was uh, mm, analyzed the concept of value of information, value of knowledge. Uh, in fact, it is how and uh, where information is use because value is largely dependent on place and time of information. Also knowledge speaking in general is highly dependent on the context of, of application of knowledge. Data have great value if they are used in the right time and in the right place. And also uh, uh, 
a question of how many uh, people uh, are using certain type of uh, information platforms, how many people are using certain type of information. This question is also linked with the notion of a value of information. And then uh, uh, certain um, practical uh, aspects of uh, information platforms are analyzed like uh, uh, digital wallet uh, and uh, its uh, significance in the modern uh, <coughs> commodity transactions uh, in modern economy. Alibaba, Alipay, uh, payment methods. Uh, and nowadays, uh, modern ways of using uh, digital wallets, not only for payment, but for crediting, for making loans, for investments, and even for insurance. Even for insurance. Uh, another presentation uh, was focused on uh, so-called GRASS project. GRASS project uh, uh, is a project uh, of a graduate in uh, soft skills. How to graduate, how to grade soft skills. There is a problem of evaluation of soft skills. It's very, very hard to give a precise evaluation of soft skills. And in this presentation, uh, a new method uh, of uh, evaluation uh, is uh, given uh, through digital badges. This is interesting method of grading, uh, eff efficient way of grading, transparent way of grading, and uh, very suitable for grading of soft skills. In the third presentation of this session, uh, so-called wicked problems are analyzed. Wicked problems are uh, hard problems, very hard, unprecedented with unprecedented uh, uh, dynamics. Those are complex problems, and they are very hard to be analyzed. Then a very important advice was given. It is much better to put such problems, carefully explained, on the open access platforms, instead of trying to offer some kind of solution. It's better to challenge scientific publicity, to be focused on such problems using interdisciplinary approach. Uh, and in fourth presentation, uh, we were uh, informed about uh, the case of uh, big models, uh, about uh, uh, how those big models are used uh, for the analysis of a very complex uh, phenomena like multidisciplinary phenomena, like uh, diseases, vector-borne diseases, like epidemics. Those hybrid models are analyzed and their place and uh, their potential in education of a student of certain uh, schools. Uh, and particularly the focus was on so-called criticality. Criticality is a phenomenon when uh, we have, when we are faced with the uh, interaction of uh, different uh, uh, causes uh, of different inputs that uh, have a, uh, effect on uh, behavior of certain model. And uh, an interesting proposal uh, was put forward uh, to use students uh, for uh, feeding uh, such big models, feeding with data, using students for calibration. Uh, in the session 3.3, three, a review of uh, dual um, economy, uh, of dual education uh, systems was analyzed. Yes, uh, ef the title uh, is Effects of Dual Education at Different Levels. And the review of dual education system is uh, given and comparison between dual education in developed countries and underdeveloped countries, particularly in Serbia. And I think this uh, presentation, uh, in fact, two presentations have a great value for Serbia now because we are in the process of uh, introducing uh, dual education. And I have to tell you that in Serbia, there are many tragedies about dual education. And it's very good to hear such uh, presentations uh, mm, and to compare uh, potentials and uh, uh, problems uh, that may emerge in dual education in 
highly developed economy like US economy and in Serbian economy and in all other developing economies. Uh, dual system of education is a necessity. It is market driven necessity and uh, it is expected that it will serve well in developed also as in developing economies. A focus uh, uh, in another presentation was uh, on a human individuality, uh, that uh, education uh, should uh, develop uh, human individuality. The goal or the task of education is to make the person uh, holistically mature. Uh, thus, uh, experience uh, of uh, Chinese philosophy is used in the process of curricula creation. Uh, we were informed about the Chinese tradition uh, of uh, yin and yang thinking, of yin and yang thinking, uh, and the interesting uh, circle, uh, closed circle is mentioned, the uh, circle consisting of five elements, five stages, closed circle, consisting of five stages, five elements. One is the basic element uh, of um, so-called water element. This is element of imitation. Wood, element of learning. Fire, element of teaching. Earth, element of coaching. And metal, element of innovation. And then again, element of imitation of <coughs> innovation, etc. So it is an uh, interesting use of uh, traditional philosophical uh, background. Uh, panel uh, 4.3 uh, was the most heterogeneous uh, panel I attended. Uh, uh, the title uh, is uh, Education for Sustainability and Inclusiveness for People and Nature. Uh, in the first presentation, Education for Sustainability is analyzed uh, inclusiveness of people is uh, analyzed, uh, particularly uh, the focus is uh, on obligatory education in Serbia. <coughs> and uh, uh, some interesting uh, mm, ideas and facts are mentioned, particularly related with inclusive education, uh, rural population, Roma population. And, uh, environmental and social impact of education is analyzed. Uh, in the second uh, presentation, uh, under intriguing title, uh, artificial intelligence is more dangerous than nukes. Uh, sustainable development goals were analyzed in uh, time dimension using uh, different scenarios. And four transformational scenarios are mentioned. I cannot go into the details uh, but just in order to give you some impression, uh, what are those uh, five transformational scenarios? First of all, acceleration of uh, renewable energy use, number one. Number two, production growth in food chains, development of new uh, mm, economies, uh, new developing countries, new developing economies, so the development should be uh, continuous. Uh, for investments and impact of investments. And fifth uh, scenario is use of so-called theta model of investment evaluation. Uh, third presentation is a um, very intriguing one. Uh, uh, it, is about, it was about uh, responsible education and gender debiasing. The story was about gender equality in education systems. And I think the most of discussions uh, after the session were uh, linked with uh, this uh, presentation. And finally, fourth presentation uh, was about networks <coughs> as a sources of knowledge uh, and as a means of uh, education and potential benefits, uh, but also threats of using networks in education system and in science are mentioned. Uh, many questions uh, remain open and uh, some discussion also was about uh, potential use of uh, networks in education process. Thank you. Good evening.
The panel, Rapid Evolution of the Education System, Impacts of Science, Technology, and Politics, started off with a description of the Anthropocene. We're facing a change that has no precedent, and, and, and most of the changes that are happening and the way we are coping with these changes, most of it is not very conscious. It's none of the, change, uh, none of the ways we are coping with it is, is well thought, well organized, and, and, and well planned. And uh, some of this change seems to be greater than we can cope, and we are having to handle new areas now. <coughs> Sustainability, digitization, increased mobility, and um, the tools that we are using, are the tools and the methods that we are using to cope with this change is from the age of modernity, not from the Anthropocene. We, we're trying to find solutions from wherever we have knowledge. This is like uh, the man who tries to look for a key under the uh, lamp when he's actually dropped it elsewhere, but then he's, he, there's this, it's dark there. But then the description was not all about how um, difficult things are now. The discussion went on to, to, to great ideas, to best practices, and uh, one of the ideas is that we need a global perspective, but in order to get a global perspective, we first need to understand the connection between the global and the local. And then our discussion went to the value of all branches of knowledge, of the physical sciences, of the natural sciences, business, finance, technology, but also of the arts, the humanities. We need the humanities to create a space for, for, for truth, for beauty, for philosophy, for values, for, for a free mind. And uh, all these branches together can create an integration of knowledge and creativity. The second panel, roles of academic mobility and digital tools in research and education, this continued with the theme of integration. Uh, this, uh, there was a description of the digital tools of open educational resources, the OERs. These are a very powerful tool today. We, we have uh, all the information or access to all the information there is in, in, in a cell phone. At the same time, the human values, the interconnections between people, the relationships, these are also important. And so, this is where hybrid learning comes in, an integration of the offline methods and the online methods. This is even more powerful. OER and digital learning may be a powerful tool, but when they are blended with the, the human, then it becomes an even more powerful tool. And uh, when integration of these two can be powerful, integration of you know, students, student exchanges, you know, ev has even greater results. The mobility of students, student exchange, uh, Manchester United and Real Madrid are not the only ones that can uh, gain from mobility. Every school, every college gains when we have student exchange, when people move from one place to another. Not just the students, but the teachers, the learning, not the academic learning, but uh, comprehensive, holistic learning is great when there is this mobility. The question of the brain drain and the brain gain, they also come, but that comes when there is economic disparity between two countries, two societies. One gains and then the other loses. So we also need to reach a point of equilibrium at the international level. So instead of a brain drain or a bra uh, brain gain, it's a brain exchange. And uh, for want of time, I will have to squeeze in this, this very diverse and profound discussion that we had in uh, the panel, contextual knowledge, building bridges between disciplines for relevant and effective learning. This was about harmonizing with nature, nature outside of us, to move towards sustainability, which is something that we so critically and urgently need, and also harmonizing with our inner nature to reach a space where we can connect with ageless wisdom. And uh, the underlying thread in all of these panels that I, I, I believe I saw was that uh, contradictions are complementary. And uh, the direction in which future education could go is, is towards integration. Integration of the global and the local, of formal learning and informal learning, of education and societal needs, of the sciences and the humanities, and of our inner humanity with outer knowledge. Thank you.
So we need a presentation here, but I don't know if somebody is there. Okay. Yeah, okay, so you can see here three panels I'm going to report about. So, uh, but basically, so I have a feeling that uh, we have put a lot of wonderful ideas together on the table and now somebody needs to be brave and clever enough to put some kind of puzzle out of that. So it's really like, it was interesting to, to listen lot of different ideas and so the first panel was about social and humanistic sciences in the era of fourth industrial revolution. First uh, topic that was discussed was the tension between maximizing profit and maximizing well-being and social cohesion in our society. So panelists, they, they had impression that uh, in too many uh, situations, societies, communities, companies, uh, even educational institutions, they are looking for maximizing uh, profit. But on the other side, so the idea that social sciences and humanities are very important and that they are going to be even more important in future is something that was uh, agreed among uh, panelists. So uh, next, uh, we had a very nice story about challenges. It was about uh, developing of a strategy, national strategy for sustainable development. But on the other side, how to develop this strategy in a participative way and how to implement that when you have very low level of uh, awareness among uh, many stakeholders. So there is a kind of the tension and the gap uh, that is relevant not only for implementation, but also for development, development of the idea. Then uh, we, we have learned a very interesting case from Netherlands. It was told to us by uh, the colleague who worked in the water management ministry. They're building bridges, uh, highways, dikes. And he told us uh, that uh, at certain point they realized that building, to build dikes, it's not only a technological problem, but it's, it's about social transformation of life of people in the community. So then he has decided to study psychology in order to be able to understand something what he was not able to understand before as, uh, as engineer. And also we had a nice talk about uh, application of artificial intelligence in uh, building understanding how human beings communicate, how they understand uh, languages in everyday communication. So the next panel is about impact of research and innovation on education. In this panel we have uh, discussed about the idea that education nowadays should be more oriented toward production of the knowledge and not uh, reproduction of the old knowledge. So uh, then it, we had very interesting debate about threat of populism and how it might influence uh, uh, not only uh, education but also society. Then also we have discussed about uh, policy-oriented research and how it is different in very important way from typical scientific uh, research studies. And then uh, the panelists, they put the stress on the, on the development of young researchers and they put the stress that it is very much important to somehow secure autonomy and creativity, space for creativity for younger generation of researchers. Then uh, we had the story from the uh, teaching education uh, institution from the Switzerland and how they uh, transform the institution in order to support uh, teachers to become researcher as well, but also to establish more effective collaboration with practitioners. Uh, and also we have discussed about the need for better understanding and collaboration between policy makers, researchers and practitioners. And this is a recurrent issue because we can see that many communities, they operate in separated communities, but they would need to collaborate in order to approach and solve some complex social issues. Uh, then we had uh, also discussion about the gap or tension between current model of higher education and future jobs, then tension between education 
and the research component uh, in the higher education, then tension between social sciences and humanities on one side and other science sciences on the other side. And also it was very nicely discussed that uh, uh, higher education institutions and research institutions, they need really good uh, managers in order to be able to really use their capacities and resources in the best way. And the last panel was about learning by collaborating so that uh, we have agreed that uh, in fu future generations they will need strong collaboration competencies, that collaboration is really very challenging because it is so nice co to collaborate with people who are the same like you are, but of course the life is about collaboration with uh, very different others. Then we also have discussed about the gap between uh, dominant models of education nowadays and the, the need to build or to support students to build collaboration competencies. But we also have very nice example from the US, uh, from the higher education institution about very simple course that supports students to develop uh, collaborative uh, skills and competencies. Then we have a talk about, uh, uh, fr from the colleague from UNICEF in Serbia. Uh, she has told us about their experience in building a long-term strategy and how it takes a lot of collaboration. And uh, so that, that was interesting uh, perspective on the complex collaboration. Then we had an example uh, from the from a European project about outdoor uh, education and how it might be good platform to somehow improve uh, current education and to support uh, development of key competencies among young generation. And finally, we had very nice uh, story about from Russia. It is the big research institute like really natural science, uh, nuclear physics, and this kind of sciences. But then they are very big. Also, you have different professions, different sciences. They need to collaborate, but also they need to collaborate with young people who are coming to visit the institution. So again, we, we learned about complex life of collaboration in everyday life. So this is it. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone for your valiant efforts and I just wanted to make a concluding remark uh, uh, or some kind of a reflection on this effort to summarize uh, the entire uh, conference in, in a short time. I think it's clear that there's a wide range of themes. There are different views. There's also a remarkable amount of overlap. Uh, you know, I think everybody agrees on things like soft skills, a need for soft skills, for flexibility. I think it's also clear that with this, that kind of diversity of views, the future of education is not going to be one thing. Let's just be, accept that, that different models will be taken up in different places and perhaps that is also a good thing because context is so important, there are different histories and different education systems, different local needs, different demographics and so many other contextual factors. But I think it's also amazing to be, uh, to have had this opportunity to be at this forum and to hear such a broad range of issues raised uh, from different perspectives, different disciplinary angles and I think we all have something to take home from that. Thank you.